So I'm sure as parents, you'll be sitting there thinking, what is it that these schools will do for my daughter, in our case, that will help them be ready for a future that is so uncertain? I'll start with a small caveat. A good school is a good school. There are no good, there are plenty of good co-ed schools and plenty of good single-sex schools. There are also ones that are not so good. And all schools are different. Some will be a better fit for your child than others. And you do know your child best, which is clearly what you will be doing as you consider your options. With that up front, though, I'm actually going to tell you why I believe girls' schools are better for girls. It's well documented that girls do better academically in an all-girls school. Indeed, one of our schools this year, Oxford High, has been awarded the best A-level results in the country. So if you want top-notch academic results, then sending your daughter to a girls' school makes sense. But you know and I know that there's so much more to a great education than just exam results. So how else do girls' schools give their pupils an edge? Firstly, there's less gender stereotyping at single-sex schools. There are no boy subjects or girl subjects because every subject is a girl subject. This means girls are far more likely to opt for science and maths. At A-level, the proportion of GDST students taking science, technology, engineering and maths, also known as STEM subjects, is significantly higher than the figures for girls nationally. In 2019, half of our A-level students took one or more of the sciences compared to just over one in five nationally, and 40% studied maths. Now, you may be saying at this point, but my daughter loves art or drama. But the important thing is she won't then be pigeonholed for choosing a subject that may be considered a girly type of subject or a softer option than a STEM subject, because, as I said, all subjects are for girls. This also can lead to women uh, who went to girls' schools becoming more successful in the jobs market and earning more in later life, as they are more likely to work in male-dominated and better-paid industries. There's really good research to back that up. Secondly, there are twice as many opportunities for girls in leadership, drama, sport, music, public speaking, and more. There's a guarantee that a girl will be the head student or prefect, the sports captain, she plays the flute, she plucks the harp, she bangs the drums, she plays Juliet and Romeo, Cleopatra and Antony, she can play Hamlet and Henry V and Prospero too. She is an actor and not just a reactor, and she never ever plays second fiddle to the first 15. Heck, she is on the first 15. Girls also learn to be leaders in all-girls schools. Every student leadership position isn't just open to every girl, it is held by a girl. The head girl and the prefects, all girls. The captains of the debating team, a girl. Director of the school play, a girl. Club leaders, you kind of get the message. They learn to find their voice and to speak up, and they're less worried about looking either too stupid or too smart. In sport, there is as much space and time and investment in, in netball as there is in rugby, in hockey, uh, in rounders and in cricket. In fact, the fastest growing sports in GDST schools right now happen to be football, rowing and cricket. Girls enjoy sport and exercise more and are more likely to stick with it in a single sex environment as they become teenagers. They get sweaty and red in the face and they don't seem to care quite as much. All this helps develop confidence that stays with them throughout their lives. Uh, a, a stunning fact that I just think is really, really salutary is the fact that girls' confidence levels start to decline from the age of eight. They only recover at the age of 80. And if you think about that, if you can provide an environment where you help build girls' confidence, that has to be a good thing. Uh, if you look at the Girl Guiding's annual Girls' Attitude Survey, it shows that one of the big reasons girls are put off being leaders is because they don't always feel they have the confidence. Girls' schools instill in them the confidence they need for a successful future. What better reason for a girls' school to thrive? Thirdly, there's very good evidence that in a mixed environment, girls get less airtime than boys. 
Even in a class that is 50-50 split between boys and girls, boys get far more than 50% of the teacher time and attention. They interrupt more, they ask more questions, they get more help. In mixed settings, girls are generally expected to be a civilizing influence on boys. And we all know that boys' schools that take girls into their sixth forms are not usually doing it because they want to give those girls the best possible education tailored to their needs, but rather to improve their position in the league tables and for financial reasons. What's in it for the girls, you may ask, going to a mixed sixth form? What does it teach them? I don't think that educating girls to believe that they are responsible for anyone else's behavior is in their long-term interests. Finally, and most importantly, a girl's time at a girl's school may be the only time in her life that she will be in an environment that is designed with her in mind, that she will be in uh, with people that put her at the center of all that they do and who have the expertise around how girls learn. I think one of the most important points is, as Cheryl said, it's not actually about single sex or co-ed, it's about finding the best school for your child. And they are all different. And it does not matter in some ways whether they're a boy or a girl, it's about their individual needs. And um, you know, looking for a good school that serves those needs um, is the most important thing, rather than getting perhaps fixated on single sex or co-ed. Now, in my career, I've worked in a um, single sex boys boarding school. I've worked in a single sex boys boarding school that became a co-ed school. I've been headmaster of a co-educational school in North London, and I'm now headmaster of a single sex boys school in Dorset. So I've, I've sort of seen it all. Um, I do have a preference with one caveat that I'll come to, but I do have a preference for uh, single sex boys education. Um, and that's probably a good thing given that I run a single sex boys school. I'll just touch on a few things that I think uh, contribute to the, the strength and the power of single sex uh, boys education. But as I say, there's one caveat I'll come back to at the end. Academically, uh, and I, I can really only speak about my school, academically our boys do really well. Uh, we normally get about 50% uh, A and A star at A level. But crucially, the value added, the, the big statistical exercise that's conducted every year across thousands of schools, shows that at A-level, our boys do, we're in the top 5% in the country. Um, and they will get typically around a third to a half of a grade more per A-level than uh, pupils at the average independent school. So that's, that's really good. That's fantastic. Especially given what else they do. Now, there will be lots of reasons why the boys at my school do that well academically. Uh, inspirational teaching, a culture of it being cool to learn, lots of other things will play into that, including the fact that they feel comfortable in their environment. Because as we all know, happy children tend to be successful children. But I've no doubt that the fact of it being a single sex school is one of the factors that contributes to that academic success. Boys uh, can sometimes get distracted by girls, um, and boys can sometimes distract girls. And it's good to have just boys in your classroom when you're teaching, I think, because you can target the lesson to the ways in which boys best learn, and you avoid that thing of the boys perhaps sometimes showing off to the girls. Cheryl talked about confidence. Boys can often appear phenomenally confident, overconfident, but in fact with a lot of boys that confidence is quite fragile and you will sometimes, I think quite often possibly in, in co-educational schools, see boys who in classes oscillate between showing off to the girls and then being overly quiet and subdued because they're afraid of saying things that might be wrong or might make them look foolish in front of girls. And I think you get much less of that uh, in, in single-sex boys' school. So I think it has a really powerful academic advantage. Cheryl also talked about gender stereotypes. And one of the things in a single-sex boys' school, as in a girls' school, is perhaps there's less pressure to conform to those stereotypes. 
And other things that is, is a huge um, part of, of life at Sherbourne is music, is art, is drama. The boys don't feel in any sense inhibited from, from getting involved in those things. And it's quite interesting. We have, we're a school of just under 600. We've got 120 boys in the main school choir. Um, and it's only not more because the choir, school, the choir stalls in the Abbey where we sing won't accommodate anymore. Music's really popular and really cool. And when you look at the boys in the choir, there are you know, music scholars and those who you think, yeah, I see why you're in the choir. There are first 15 rugby players. There are first 11 footballers. There are boys who, um, in, in some ways, you wouldn't expect to be there. But I think it's this, this absence of pigeonholing, this absence of them being inhibited by feeling that there are certain roles they have to conform to, certain things they have to do, and perhaps some things that they better avoid uh, because they're boys. They just do the things that make them happy, that they're good at, that they enjoy. And I think there's a, that restriction that you might see in terms of the boys feeling that they have to be a certain sort of person. You don't see that in single-sex boys' schools. One of the other things, and it's, well, it's perhaps a small, but I think it's a really important detail, and it certainly applies to my school. Schools tend to have to be of a certain size if they're to be competitive. And I'm talking not just about, but particularly in things like rugby and football. You need a certain number to choose from to be good at stuff. Because we're single sex, we can be half the size of a lot of the schools that we very successfully compete against in those things and others. And that's really important because it means we can be successful, we can be competitive, we can do really well in those things, but we still, because we're just under 600, uh, we have an intimacy about the school. And I think that's really important. We are getting to the stage in the year, uh, with the new boys having been there for a few weeks, when I'm pretty close to knowing the name of every single boy in the school. And you can do that in a school of the size that Sherman is, you can't do that in a school that's twice as big, unless you're much better than I am, but you, I certainly couldn't do it. So, you know, in that sense, size does matter. We, are, we have an intimacy about us, but we are still strong, competitive in the things that, you know, a lot of boys like to do. I don't think it matters very much. I think there are other things which matter much, much more. And we all know that we are a combination of male and female characteristics, each of us. There is no single type of a girl, there is no single type of a boy. The world is not a heterosexual environment. The assumption that you have to be um, distracted by the opposite sex is making assumptions for teenagers they may not wish to accept. And from my experience of being a heterosexual teenager, you do, do not need boys in the room to be distracted by them. So. What are the important questions? I think the important question that you as parents should be asking of any school is how do we educate your child, your individual child that you know better than anybody, and prepare them for their adult lives? That's what, that's what matters. Qualifications, dare I say it, are a given. All of us, parents, schools, teachers, all we want with regard to qualifications is that our pupils get the best possible grades that they can. That is a given. We owe it to them. It is necessary for them to have the doors still open as they go into adulthood, that their aspirations, their abilities, their potential deserve. I think what matters more is how we as a school, with parents, nurture character and attitudes. What are the values that this child is going to live by as an adult? Are they going to be the values of integrity, the values of team working, the values of balancing self-confidence with selflessness? Are they going to be the values of community, the value of service? These are the values which will inform a better society at the hands of the next generation of children coming out of our schools. We should also be seeking to nurture their social and their societal readiness to move beyond school. One of the biggest dangers of a big boarding school like mine, much as we do our utmost to ensure that there is still a large and wide social range within the school, is that it is a bubble, a bubble of privilege. 
and when they leave school, that's not the world into which they will graduate. What do we do to make them ready for that world? At my school, for example, we have twin pillars that embrace the taught curriculum. One is the life of learning, and the other is learning for life. That as schools, we, I want to encourage all my children to regard themselves as being scholars, whatever their ability, because that scholarly impetus going into adult life gives a continuing curiosity and humility and a wish to learn, which we all know fosters a happy adult life. Learning for life, what are the things that our teenagers want to know? We ask them, we then give them what it is that they want to know. They might, we think, want to know about sex, drugs and rock and roll, all the things that have traditionally been in the PSHE programme. But learning for life is about so much more than that. It's about finance, for example. It's about team working. It's about leadership. It's about the qualities of leadership. So, boys and girls are different. Boys and girls are different within their groups and across their groups. Of my own children, I have two boys and two girls. I have two grandsons and two granddaughters. I get the difference. Of my four children, the two who are most like each other are one of my boys and one of my girls. Boys and girls are different. To generalize about what is right for all girls is as wrong as generalizing about what is right for your child. You know your child. You know what they are like, and you will find the right school for them, whatever that is. But I do think that the gender dynamic of that school, whether it's all boys or all girls, is not the most important question that you should be asking. So we're preparing our children to fly, preparing our children to leave us. And I'm not educating the 18-year-old. I'm educating the 88-year-old. I'm educating the person who's going to go on to a long and, I hope, happy and fulfilling life. And that life will be co-educational. And that life, I hope, will embrace the fact that people are different and that what is right for one is not right for the other. But in the end, leaving school knowing that the best friendships are the most important things in our life and that these can be between girls and between boys, I think is the greatest gift schools can give.